Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we have our speak Oxstan Maland for a new episode of the Research Spotlight. Oxstan is in the third year of his PhD in Professor Odysseus Group of Carbon-14 Labeling Lab at Paris Secular University. Before that, he got his bachelor's degree from the National School of Chemistry of Montpellier. He has rich internship experience in companies such as Spirochem and specific polymers. Today, he is going to share with us the synthesis of isotopic carbon labeled compounds using relatively cheaper isotopic carbon dioxide as an isotope source. Let's turn it over to Oxten. Thank you for the kind introduction and for giving us the opportunity to share our works on your platform. Today, I would like to feature our last article about the generation of labeled radical anion via a photo-induced equilibration between formate and labeled carbon dioxide. To begin with, I would like to give a brief introduction about carbon isotope radiolabeling, which is the main field of interest in our lab. As you all may know, there are three main isotopes of carbon. The first one is carbon-13, which is the stable isotope with various applications. We can showcase its application in earth science or in urea test, but above all, it's an essential tool for organic chemists in chemical structure elucidation using carbon NMR. The other one is carbon-11. Carbon-11 is a beta plus emitter with an half-life of 20 minutes. Its main field of application is in medical imaging with PET scans. Because of its high activity, it requires quite specific technical facilities to manipulate it. And I will come to it later. The last one is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a beta minus emitter with an half-life of 5730 years. It has application in many fields of life science, like in drug discovery or crop sciences. It is also the keystone of radiocarbon dating in art or history research. The insertion of isotopic labels onto organic molecules is a well-known tool to track the phase of synthetic organic compounds and unveil their behavior both in the environment and in vitro or in vivo. As carbon is omnipresent, the insertion of carbon isotopes labeled onto organic compounds has received an extensive attention. In the top of that, carbon-14 could serve as a traceless tag. This tool, in association with beta-minus counting and beta-minus imaging technologies, provides a vital knowledge on the fate of organic molecules in livings. That's why, Carbon-14 studies are commonly used in all life sciences divisions. Furthermore, those data are mandatory for worldwide regulatory agencies like FDA or ECD, for example. Nonetheless, the synthesis of a drug isotopologue represents a real challenge due to the simplicity of carbon-14 building blocks that are available. Thus, you usually have to redesign a totally new multi-step synthesis. Furthermore, those building blocks normally lead to the insertion of the carbon-14 in the early stages of your synthesis. And also the cost of the building blocks has to be taken in consideration. This usually elicits the production of radioactive waste, tremendous cost and a low radiochemical yield. That's why in the lab, we aim to develop new labeling strategies using a late stage approach or a carbon isotope exchange strategy. The role resting on the use of common and affordable carbon-14 building blocks. And this is in this context that we were eager to develop a new late stage labeling carboxylation methodology using the radical anion of carbon dioxide. In contrast to the numerous carboxylation methodologies developed using carbon dioxide as an electrophilic partner, the use of carbon dioxide radical anion has only recently gained in popularity. Indeed, 
In 2017, Jamison published seminal works in which the access to the radical anion from carbon dioxide using a photocatalytic system under UV radiation. Jamison managed in his reaction to perform a radical radical coupling, paving the way to the formation of specific amino acids, while Romo published the use of this radical anion in carboxylation of activated alkenes. Despite the improvement of the conditions over the years, the high reduction potential of carbon dioxide makes the reaction challenging. That's why, in 2021, the group of Vikens has recently developed an innovative approach, enabling the formation of the radical anion through an HAT catalyst starting from formate. They even managed to export their methodology to the carboxylation of heterocycles in a more recent paper. Unfortunately, the exportation of such a methodology in carbon-14 is not feasible. Indeed, the use of carbon-14 formate is not an option because of some drawbacks interesting to the formate. Carbon-14 formate is highly expensive and it is usually and always delivered in water solution which is not suitable for all methodologies. And also, and this is a more critical point, the chemical purity is questionable. To highlight this cost difference, you can see on the top right of this slide the difference between those two compounds. You can see on the left that the carbon dioxide is around 30 kilo euros for 18 millimoles, where sodium formate labeled with carbon-14 is almost 10 times more expensive than the carbon dioxide. With all those limitations taken in consideration, we hypothesize that maybe we could generate radical anion using cold formate as starting material and then an equilibration between the radical and labeled carbon dioxide could occur. In this way, we should be able to generate the labeled radical anion, which could be then easily used in the carboxylation method. This strategy could be a way to use a cheaper carbon-14 C1 source and it could be also the solution to overcome formate purity concerns. The equilibration should be fast, and so it should also be a quite useful and efficient radiolabeling tool. We were quite pleased to observe that this strategy was feasible by simply exposing formate to an organic photocatalyst, a thiol as HAT catalyst, and labeled carbon dioxide. Indeed, after optimization, a significant isotopic enrichment of 60% could be reached. This is quite characteristic in proton NMR, with the apparition of a triplet around 8.3 ppm. Indeed, your carbon-13 is coupling with proton. Then you can do the isotopic enrichment analysis directly in proton NMR. Once this is done, we also confirm that the use of this radical anion was suitable for late-stage carboxylation. Once optimized, we achieved to lower the catalytic charge to 0.5 mol per cent and using 1.5 equivalent of carbon dioxide. Furthermore, enrichments were all close of the maximum isotopic enrichment we could get. Indeed, in this case, this is not possible to reach a 100% isotopic enrichment due to isotopic dilutions. This dilution is ruled by the following equation, which is basically the amount of carbon-13 you add in your reaction mixture divided by the quantity of all carbon in your reaction mixture. In the lab, we are able to add a precise amount of carbon dioxide using a 3 tech manifold. Thanks to this, we were able to study the isotopic dilution that is taking place in this experiment. To give you an insight of all this is working, 
I will show you how the reaction is set up. To do so, a reactor is connected to the manifold, which is frozen under liquid nitrogen. Then vacuum is applied in the wall system. Next, carbon dioxide is released in the red chamber by heating a zeolite cartridge where carbon dioxide is trapped. Thanks to the manometer and the ideal gas law, you can easily determine the exact amount of carbon dioxide you add. Then, you usually observe a white deposit when it is trapped in your reactor, as you can see on this picture. With this technology and with this study, we showcased that the isotopic dilution taking place in our reaction was following the theoretical curves, meaning that if you want to use this methodology for a specific labeling, you can easily predict the precise amount on and the precise equivalent you need to reach a precise specific activity. Afterwards, we explored the substrate tolerance and we were quite pleased to obtain good yields, but more especially with great isotopic enrichments. The conditions were applicable to substrate bearing sensible functional groups, such as primary amines, boronic acids, or aryl chloride. However, on this kind of substrate, the substitution of the alkene part was not very well tolerated, paving the way to systematically a loss in the yield. Above all, we managed to export the methodology to carbon-14, with yields similar to carbon-13. The molar activity is in line with ADM studies, but especially as far as we know, this is the first time description of this radical anion with carbon-14. Pleasingly, the hydrocarboxylation was shown to work also with acrylamides and enones. This was quite interesting for us because it was a way to synthesize, for example, labeled aspartic acid. More importantly, we managed to make drug derivatization with moderate yields but an interesting isotopic enrichment, demonstrating a great substrate tolerance. Surprisingly, when NND substituted acrylamides were engaged in our conditions, we always isolated the final product as a mixture of two isotopomers. This can be easily seen in carbon NMR and also in HRMS. We hypothesized that this phenomenon was going through a succinic anhydride intermediate. However, we never managed to observe this intermediate. Nevertheless, we managed to hydrocarboxylate seven other acrylamides with function quite sensible to reduction or degradation. Also, some of those substrates could be used as drug precursors. One tremendous highlight of this project was the possibility to apply it to Carbon-11 with our collaborators at Biomaps. As I mentioned before at the very beginning of this presentation, Carbon-11 has a very short half-life of 20 minutes and it requires specific facilities, as you can see on the right of this slide. We optimized our conditions and managed to reach a 39% of radiochemical conversion on the model substrate. With those conditions, we carboxylated three compounds, and more especially, this oxaprosine compound. However, despite a good radiochemical yield, the molar activity was quite low compared to carbon-11 standards. That's why we decided to highlight the feasibility of biodistribution analysis despite this low activity, and we were quite successful to obtain a consistent biodistribution result. Then we were eager to develop also the biscarboxylation reaction using this radical anion. To do so, we slightly modified the catalytic system. Here we are still using the same photocatalyst but we removed the diol to replace it by DAPCO as HAT catalyst. And also we removed water from the solvent 
and we add molecular sieves instead. Using those conditions, and in only one hour, we managed to obtain six examples that are decarboxylated. We were quite interested in this kind of decarboxylated compound because in a simply two-step cyclization, you can access to this kind of heterocycle. This heterocycle is quite interesting because you can find it in many drugs. That's why we were eager to prove that with our methodology, you can access to this kind of labeled heterocycles. Indeed, we managed to do it with six examples, doing some diversification on the decarboxylated compound, but also on the amine. One milestone was the exportation of this methodology in carbon-14. And indeed, we managed to synthesize the mesoximide, which is an anticonvulsant developed by Pfizer many years ago. And we managed to synthesize it with a 20% uh, overall yield, which is a moderate yield, but more especially with a very high molar activity of 2.62 gigabacterial per millimole, which is in line with ADMS studies, but even with quantitative body wall autoradiography. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope you all enjoy it. I would like to thank all the LMC team, but more especially all the people who worked on this project, and more especially uh, Davide Odizio and Frédéric Tao without whom the project would not have been possible. Thank you all. Thank Oxtem for sharing their work with us. They have showcased a strategy that takes advantage of the photo-induced equilibration between isotopic carbon dioxide and normal formate salts, enabling more effective synthesis of isotopic carbon labeled carbonic acid and pharmaceutically relevant compounds. This is important for radiochemistry application such as PET imaging. Please put a thumbs up and subscribe us if you like it. Bye for now.